My ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to the second day of this year's Leanne Collins Security Policy Conference. The main topic for this year's conference is security towards 2030, adapting to new realities. Yesterday, you could hear Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General of NATO, the former High Representative of the EU for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy of uh, Federica Mogherini, and an interesting panel to discuss uh, the ongoing geopolitical change process, NATO and the EU's challenges, as well as various players place and role in today's international development. Today we move to the digital domain. We'll be looking closer at uh, digitalization and the ensuing security policy threats. It exposes our democratic societies in completely new ways. We're touching on influence operations, cyber attacks, and other non-military threats against democracy. And we'll be asking how Norway can brace and prepare against this type of threats. Cecilia Hellestweit is today's moderator. She is a popular media commentator. She holds a PhD in international humanitarian law and has also published several books, amongst others, on the Middle East. Cecilia will talk to Minister of Foreign Affairs Ina Eriksson Sørdeide on today's topic and chair a panel debate with prominent media representatives and researchers. Before passing the word to Cecilia, I would like to ask you to participate by submitting questions along the way. You can do that by accessing the conference's own website, leancollinsecurityconference.com. This also goes for all of you who follows the conference uh, on Facebook or other social medias. You need to access our website for us to pick up your questions. All I need to do now is to introduce the first keynote speaker whom we've told to give an overarching picture of the challenges democracies now face uh, against the digital technology. Indeed, a great pleasure for me to introduce Stanford professor and best-selling author of books like The End of History and the Last Man, The Origin of Political Order and Political Decay, and his last one called Identity, The Demand for Dignity of the Politics of Resentment. After over 30 years in the international spotlight of political science, Francis Fukuyama hardly needs an introduction. We are so honored to have you with us. Today, you will give a speech under the title, How to Save Democracy from Technology. Please, Fukuyama, over to you. Hello. I'm very pleased to be able to address the Norwegian Atlantic Committee this is a critical time in global history, and the issues that you are addressing are important to all of our countries. I should begin by saying that I'm very happy that Joe Biden was elected as the 46th president of the United States. The past four years have been very turbulent and very bad for the Atlantic community. And I think that under this new presidency, the United States will return to its traditional commitments to Atlantic solidarity. This morning, I want to talk about two issues. First is the geopolitical context in which we are living. And the second has to do with the role of IT specifically and the large IT platforms. So let's begin with the changing international context. There has been a return of great power competition and a global democratic recession, which at this point in 2021 has now been going on for the last 15 years. On the one hand, you see the rise of consolidated authoritarian powers, primarily Russia and China. They present different kinds of challenges to the Western world. In the case of Russia, they have a relatively weak uh, political base and economic base but they're willing to take large risks and they're also willing to be very creative in their use of new instruments of power. Peter Pomerantsev has written about how the nature of Russian propaganda has changed from Soviet times. It used to be that they would promote their own system. They're not interested in doing that any longer. What they want to do is sow, sow doubt in the minds of democratic publics about the legitimacy of their own political systems. China has been a little bit later to this cyber uh, weaponization, 
but they've learned very quickly and they're now doing some of the same things that Russia is, but with a much larger resource base. And I think we can expect to see China insert itself into democratic politics to a much larger degree. The other major change in the geopolitical environment is the rise of populism that was first marked by the election of Donald Trump in 2016 and by the British vote to leave the European Union. Populism has a lot of roots. Part of it is economic from the inequalities created by globalization that has left behind working class populations in many rich countries. But it has taken on a cultural dimension in which the resentment of ordinary people against the kinds of elites that have been governing uh, many de democracies has evolved into a form of tribalism. In the United States, we have a particularly severe case of this where identity has become the major dividing line between uh, so-called red and blue sides of this division. And in fact, where loyalty to a single individual, former President Trump, has become the hallmark of what it means to be a Republican and not ideology, not policy issues. Uh, it's a pure form of personalistic politics. The two sides of this uh, democratic decline, the rise of great powers and the internal divisions within democratic countries are related to each other because it is those divisions that the other great powers, the authoritarian great powers can exploit. And both of them have been very good at doing that. Now, let me turn to the role of information technology and particularly to the role of the large platforms and what their impact on democratic politics has been. And by the way, when I talk about the internet platforms, I'm really just talking about three companies. I'm talking about Twitter, Facebook, and Google. The challenge that they present is directly related to their scale. I think we need to begin by noting that they are not responsible for the existence of fake news and conspiracy theories. These theories have always existed. They exist in the society and actually their expression is protected by our provisions in modern democracies for freedom of speech. I don't think the objective of policy should ever be to simply eliminate the ability of people to believe even in the most crazy kinds of conspiracy theories. The problem that is posed by the platforms is directly related to their scale. They are so dominant that they resemble in the United States, the three large television networks that controlled political discourse back in the 1950s and 60s. And the real threat that they pose is not that they carry fake news or conspiracy theories, but rather that they have a great power of either amplifying or silencing certain voices. This power, I think, has been on display uh, most recently with Twitter's ban on Donald Trump that began after the January 6th attack on the US Capitol. It's been remarkable the degree to which the US president could be silenced by a decision by a single private company and the executives that control it. Uh, and it illustrates degree to which these companies have become politically extremely powerful. So I think that the problem that they present, uh, first of all, there are economic aspects to this in, to, in terms of their ability to exclude competition, but that's not the issue that I think we need to worry about in the security community. It really has to do more with their influence over democratic politics. At the moment, we may approve some of the short-term decisions that these companies have taken uh, to take down material that is right-wing, inflammatory, encouraging violence. But in the long run, I do not think that this is an adequate uh, approach for a, de a liberal democracy to take. It's not sustainable to simply rely on the good decisions of a private party that has no democratic accountability. There is no legitimacy to a large private company taking decisions that are this politically important. I think that a number of alternative methods have been 
suggested for reducing the underlying power of these companies. And I think that all of these need to be pursued. Uh, these would include, for example, antitrust uh, actions. These have already been undertaken uh, first by the European Union, but now by the US Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission, as well as a coalition of state attorney generals. You can have regulation. This is something that is much more possible in Europe uh, with a longer history of efforts to regulate the private sector than in the United States. Uh, there's the idea of data portability, which is intended to enable greater competition uh, among platforms. And finally, there is privacy law like Europe's GDPR that in theory should prevent uh, a large platform from moving data generated in one area and using it to achieve dominance in another area. I think that all of these ideas are important. They need to be explored. But ultimately, I don't think that any of them will be sufficient to address the central political threat that I think the platforms present, which is this ability to either amplify or silence particular political voices. They may solve other problems like the missing economic competition uh, in that sphere, but they don't address the threat to democracy itself. Uh, my group at Stanford, the Working Group on Platform Scale, uh, has made a suggestion for how to deal with this issue, which we label middleware. Uh, this would involve the creation of a competitive layer of companies to which the big internet platforms could outsource content curation. The problem that they pose right now is that the feeds that you get uh, on one of the platforms is really determined by the companies themselves through non-transparent algorithms that are meant to serve the company's bottom line and not the needs of a democratic public. They're completely non-transparent. They're developed by AI programs. And I think what we would want to see is their replacement by user control. And the easiest way to do this at the present moment uh, is to outsource them to uh, middleware companies that could take those feeds and tailor them uh, for reliability, for product uh, uh, choice, uh, for political preference, but in ways that would be uh, determined by the users themselves and not by these large corporations. It's not clear whether this will solve the problem. There are many uh, issues that would have to be worked out, like their business model or the regulatory regime uh, that would be required to create this. But I think it's important on a global level. Uh, Facebook, for example, has been hugely important in supporting authoritarian policies in countries like India or Myanmar or the Philippines. And that company on its own does not have the capacity to make good political choices as to what is acceptable content. And I think this proposal is something that could be adopted internationally by other uh, countries in which, for example, NGOs or nonprofit groups could be the filters that would provide reliable information uh, to local publics. So this is my view of the current challenges we face. <clears throat> I wish uh, I could participate uh, directly in your conference, but I wish you luck. And uh, I hope that it's dis your discussions will lead to practical solutions that can be implemented by members of our Atlantic community. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Francis, for this splendid and thought-provoking introduction, perfectly tailored to today's subject on non-military threats to democracy and resilience in a digital world. We will now turn more specifically to information campaigns in the digital era. And to enlighten us on some of the main challenges, it is my true pleasure to present to you the author of Active Measures, The Secret History of Disinformation and Political Warfare, Professor Thomas Ridd. Please, Thomas, the floor is yours. Hello, Norway. It is a pleasure to be invited to the Leon Collin Conference 2021. 
My name is Thomas Ridd. I'm a professor of strategic studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC, and I'm author of Active Measures, The Secret History of Disinformation and Political Warfare, published uh, in April last year. I'm going to talk today about the difference between analog, pre-internet, Cold War, disinformation operations, active measures, influence operations is another word term often used, and internet age, digital 21st century information operations. This is a change that has many dimensions, this change between analog and digital. And I think we can only fully understand what is happening today if we look at the 20th century. In a nutshell, you cannot understand intelligence operations and cyber operations in the 21st century if you don't first understand intelligence operations in the 20th century. And that, of course, applies to active measures especially. Active measures, let me start with a conceptual observation. Active measures are a more useful term in many ways than disinformation. Although active measures as a concept which originated in the Eastern Bloc was used in uh, Russian, uh, in German, in Czechoslovak, uh, in, uh, in different languages in, in the Eastern Bloc and in, in fact also among the adversaries at the time in the West. The concept active measures evolved in the 1960s inside the Soviet intelligence bureaucracy in order to um, over overcome this, this focus on disinformation, which in some ways was counterproductive. Today, when we talk about disinformation, there is always this aspect of, are we looking at forgeries, at fake information, at false uh, details that were made up? But active measures really puts into sharper focus what these operations are really about. They're about activating an emotional uh, response. They're about activating nascent political frictions and fissures, cracks in the target society. And the question whether you use forged information, fake uh, documents or pictures, or whether the stories that you use from an offensive point of view or the details, the files that you use and release, sometimes as leaks, whether these files are, f are factually correct or made up and manipulated, ultimately is not the most important question. The most important question is, are they activating the desired effect? Now, let me give you the, the, the key argument in a nutshell. The internet and the 21st century, not just the internet, but a number of cultural shifts that we see that are linked to the internet, obviously, have made active measures more active and less measured than they were in the Cold War. And the first observation I already um, hinted at, it's the activation of, of an emotional response. Now that, of course, is an old uh, feature. Let me give you an example. In the late 1950s, early 1960s, the Soviet KGB instigated, uh, realized that West Germany was obviously one of its main adversaries, um, and also realized that West Germany still had a problem with anti-Semitism. There was press coverage of anti-Semitic incidents, n organic, real anti-Semitic incidents happening in West Germany. The head of the uh, first chief directorate uh, unit in charge of disinformation at the time, uh, Igor um, uh, Ivan Agayans, uh, he was a, an Armenian officer and had a great appreciation for cultural weaknesses and trauma, perhaps because he was Armenian himself, and had the idea that KGB could instigate anti-Semitic incidents that were obviously man manipulated, made up in West Germany and in fact uh, in the West 
globally speaking in the United States, in the UK, even in South Africa, even in Australia, and of course across Europe, and thereby provoke an actual anti-Semitic campaign uh, or camp uh, wave of, of you know, smearings of, at synagogues and cemeteries in response to the fecum. So the very design of the operation had a blurring of lines in mind. You create something false, but you have real effects and trigger real emotional responses. Now, this means something conceptually hard to under, it's conceptually hard to understand this as an effect. You cannot say this was a fake anti-Semitic campaign. It only started as a fake anti-Semitic um, uh, incident. But, you know, think about a, a meeting that was organized on Facebook, perhaps by trolls in St. Petersburg in the United States, say, in Manhattan. The people who showed up were real, had real passions and motivations and feelings. It's only that part of the initiative was not, was manipulated. So the conceptual insight here that is so hard to, to wrap your head around is that the distinction between fake and real will com become completely uh, enmeshed once an operation is underway. And this feature, this is what I meant by activating an emotional response, has of course become more complex in the 21st century. So how does the internet play into this? Let's make an example. Let's take the Podesta leaks, which was part of the 2016 um, GRU operation uh, influencing the uh, US election. The leaks, who created the value? Let's look at the value creation chain. In the Cold War, many of these influence operations required real tradecraft, skills in forging documents, skills in surfacing documents and making journalists believe in their uh, news value, even if, if it was a fake document. In the 21st century, of course, we have a different dynamic because you can simply put online large volumes of files and information. And then the value creation happens partly in the targeted society itself because you will have people uh, journalists, but also independent researchers going into the leaked documents, creating the actual controversial value out of the leak itself. So the whole life cycle of an operation is more integrated, if you like. Uh, and that's what I meant by activated um, in a way that become more active because part of the value creation is done by the target itself. Now, let me focus just very briefly on the other aspect, on the measured, less measured. We, of course, in modern operation have data. We have URLs, we have clicks, we have impressions, a number of engagements of tweets, for example, or number of files leaked and number of times of these files covered in the press. So the illusion arises that we actually can measure the impact of an active measure of an influence operation more accur accurately than we could in the past. And here I think it is helpful to really appreciate some of the old uh, pearls of wisdom that tradecraft in the Soviet Union have created, and in fact in CIA in the 1950s. And one of the key features is related to the, the, the fact that active measures activate something that is already nascent. So you don't have a measurement device and I'm quoting Ladislav Bittman here, to peel away the inorganic effect that you achieve from the organic effect that was, is happening on its own or maybe would have happened on its own. I mean, obviously, you can sometimes intuitively say that there was some sort of effect, but quantifying it is, is exceedingly hard. So if we succumb to the temptation to think that more data mean more accuracy and more measurement of influence operations in their effect, then we risk making these operations more effective. Because here's the true constructivist nightmare that we have entered. If we collectively decide that an active measure has become 
successful based on insufficient evidence so for example the belief still widespread in among a lot of people in the United States on the center left and far left is that the 2016 Russian election interference helped Donald Trump win the election probably tipped the scale now there is no good evidence for this conclusion at all in fact all the evidence leads to the conclusion that Donald Trump won fair and square in 2016 you know just like Joe Biden won fair and square in 2020 but if we believe that Russian interference had more of an effect than we act than it actually had and if intelligence investigations indictments books by scholars press coverage etc overstates and exaggerates the data and the the way we can measure or really we cannot measure that impact then we are creating in that process an effect of an operation that was actually not there in its actual design so active measures in some ways have that feature which have a feature that is comparable to you know by observing it and describing what is happening for people like myself but for journalists and even politicians we are taking part in the operation itself I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention for introducing us to some of the key features and frankly quite disturbing trends of information warfare in the information age. I will now switch to Norwegian. Now, dear public, we're going to look at the Norwegian uh, situation. I'm going to speak Norwegian. The topic of this year's conference is adapting to new realities and we have a completely new reality. The conference is for the first time digital. The digitalization of society exposes us to completely new kinds of threats. Digitalization cancels geography, and the threats are often invisible. Cyber attacks, influence and information campaigns, fake news are all tools that other states can exploit to sow doubt, limit the latitude of decision makers, and undermine trust which is our democratic heritage and a presupposition for democracy in Norway. And this is how we wind up discussing data and democracy at the Leon Köln Security Conference in 2021, building resilience to foreign interference and the threats that both Fukuyama and RID have addressed in their keynotes. It's about an informational war, information warfare in our information societies. We're going to discuss which non-military threats the digitalization entail, which measures we can implement, and how we can strengthen our own resilience as a society to these new and demanding threats. And we have gathered an eminent panel with people from the Norwegian Defense Academia and from the press, and we are going to meet them a little bit later. But first, here in the studio in Oslo, we have been so lucky as to be uh, visited by Ine Maria Eksensødide, Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs. And I'm going to talk with her about what this development of non-military threats means to Norway. Welcome, dear Minister of Foreign Affairs. Thank you. Francis Fukuyama, in his keynote, described two, the two, them, two threats. One is the decline of democracy. The second development that he uh, talked about is about geopolitical rivalry. We have the increasing antagonism among the great powers, the great power competition. So my first question is, in which way does this great power competition influence Norway? How does this influence us? How are we exposed to this out there in the big, big world and here at home? Well, he is very right that the great powers are back in rivalry, and with the new Biden administration, many think that the rivalry between the USA and China will disappear, but they're wrong. I have been of the opinion for a long time that we'll see much of the same, perhaps with different rhetorics, a different approach, but 
that there is a deep strategic rivalry between the USA and China is something that of course influences most countries around the world, also Norway. I will return to how we are addressing this at home and abroad, but we need to take into consideration that much of the rivalry takes place in places where we don't think of as security. It's about critical infrastructure, commerce, and other fields that we don't think about in security terms. So when we are going to address this, we need to think in broader terms than just within security policy, and that's uh, a, a, a topic for this conference is today, subtly unquote. In many fields, we and other countries also depend on having a relationship to China. That is true for trade and commerce, but also for solving some of the global big challenges, for instance, climate. And then I think that we need to relate to the world as it is today, not the way it looked like a few years ago. This gives us some new opportunities, but of course also some challenges, some new challenges. Some have pointed out that Norway should not, not enter the Security Council because we would then be subject to pressure from the big powers. I said to that, and I still say that that analysis is not correct because the pressure from the superpowers is something that all countries experience to a larger or lesser extent all the time. To us, it is a lesser um, challenge um, than some other countries because in 1949, we addressed our value base. We have a Western Defense Alliance, and I know that uh, Mr. Stoltenberg talked about China and NATO's approach to China yesterday. and. Uh, he has focused on, like Norway, that the fact that NATO now is looking at China and what Chinese influence uh, leads to doesn't mean that NATO should have a military reply or response to issues in China, but it's NATO's analysis of the world must look at the world's second largest military and e financial and economic power. If not, he would not do his job. So, of course, this influences this uh, at home and abroad. But what has happened lately with increasing rivalry between superpowers is not necessarily something that puts us in a very different position than what otherwise would be the case, or, or that we are now at the Security Council. We have a good relationship with the five permanent members of the Security Council, for instance. Well, let me uh, address something you mentioned there, because when the rivalry increases, we have the big ones around the world who often clash the USA, China, and Europe, actually, in the shape of the European Union. And we see that our neighboring states in the Nordic countries who are not members of NATO. They have tried to approach NATO to have a closer relationship in recent years. The situation we're talking about is a lot about non-military measures, though. And I although NATO plays a role, perhaps the EU is also a very central player. Fukuyama mentioned digitalization, and as regards digitalization, the EU has taken a very clear stance. The, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the EU, when she entered into a trade agreement with China in December, she declared that this is my geopolitical commission. Then the question for you is, our Nordic neighbors, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland, they are all members of the EU, while Norway is not. And the question is whether we as a nation uh, find ourselves in a more vulnerable situation when geopolitics heat up in these non-military fields in the same, same situation, for instance, like uh, Switzerland and Albania. I think that as a point of departure, that is not the case, and there are many examples of this from more recent times. We were, for instance, not exposed to more pressure in any uh, direction in the question of 5G, then the country is quite a country. Many EU countries felt stronger pressure. Nordstrom 2 is another example where our criticism has been aimed at especially US sanctions that may influence also Norwegian companies, amongst other things. But I think it's important to think that in the landscape we are finding ourselves now, NATO membership and our belonging to NATO is what is central and important to us. But as regards non-military threats, the EU has, with time, also assumed a larger role, and that's a cooperation that Norway participates in to a large extent over the whole range, sharing information and, not least, working together on preventing disinformation. Uh, and 
We have worked a lot with NATO with this, especially during the pandemic. The EU worked with the with NATO because it, there were conspiracy theories stating that these two uh, agencies were responsible for this. But, but we also support restrictive measures with regard to Lukashenko and other uh, authorities or cyber operations, etc. We support measures by the EU, and we have delivered to the Norwegian Parliament a new law of sanctions and act of sanctions that gives us a full legal basis for participating in these restrictive measures with all kinds of measures. And that's also recognition of the fact that the world has changed in the olden times. Well, I, maybe I can't say in the olden times, but previously, sanctions and restrictive measures were implemented first and foremost against governments and states. Today, thematic, uh, thematic uh, sanctions and sanctions against individuals are equally important. We haven't had a legal basis for doing that fully. We will have that now. This is also an important measure for us to get closer to the European Union, where we believe that to be in our interest. And I see very clearly also that what we've been working on a lot within NATO, actually, in recent years, is to obtain a good sharing of work with the EU, a distribution of works. We should so we have a natural distribution of the responsibilities of NATO and EU, and often the military aspect is what uh, draws the line. But the EU, through its increased efforts within defense and policy, should not duplicate NATO, so that we should avoid two parallel systems, two parallel forces and systems, or that we would spend our resources incorrectly. And I would say that we have come quite far in distributing those tasks quite well now. And that is also good for us as a non-member that is a non-member of the EU. So I think that the way that we do this gives us a good balance in those relationships. When Norway is attacked with these new measures, uh, we have several things we can do. One is attribution. In the autumn of 2020, the Norwegian parliament was attacked in a major cyber attack, then the digital threat to Norway is large and increasing. And then cyber, at, cyber is a difficult thing. You know you've been attacked. You don't know, know who is behind this. And it is difficult to establish it 100%. Uh, we know attribution from law and from international law as well. And there are quite clear and strict requirements as to evidence. But political attribution is something altogether different. And in 2020, Norway it chose to attribute this attack to Russia. In 2019, a Norwegian tanker was attacked in a sabotage operation off the Emirates in the Gulf of Oman. And there was some I indirect evidence as to who were behind. But Norway then chose not to attribute the attack to anybody. How does political attribution function for Norway? What are the advantages and disadvantages in this drill? political context that we have described today. I think you described very aptly that attribution is very often difficult, particularly because players in the cyber areas uh, are concealed. They, uh, it's covert operation. But we also have a good security services that have been capable of uh, compiling information, both alone and with others. They do that every day. At any given point in time, there is uh, a series of ongoing uh, digital attacks uh, taking place, uh, and our services uh, have pointed to Russia and China as major players. But uh, the, the angle of approach is slightly different, and Fukuyama also mentioned how they act differently. But the result is very often the same, and uh, the aims are also very often the same. When we had the uh, cyber attack against the Norwegian parliament, there was some characteristic. First, it was an attack against one of our most important democratic institutions. Our assessment was that gradually, as we had information that clearly pointed towards Russia, we chose to attribute it politically because it is such an important matter that Norway cannot uh, just let pass without countering it. This doesn't mean that we expect a different uh, 
way of actions, but uh, there is uh, a political demarcation, and it was the first time we did that openly. We also sometimes attributed politically without being open. That's we, sometimes we can do it also along with other partners, and we've there have also been examples of that in recent years. But for us, it was very important to do that specifically, particularly because it involved the Norwegian Parliament. In government, we've also drawn up uh, guidelines for attribution, because like you say, there are pros and cons of doing it. And one would always need to make an overarching political assessment of it, particularly when it comes to the importance of the attack. And in that particular incident, it was against the Norwegian Parliament. We saw that uh, when we did that, that apparently also created some discomfort uh, uh, in Russia. And I discussed that with Sergei Lavrov, uh, the recent one being one and a half weeks ago. And I was clear that to us, uh, we will always attribute it politically when we have information that points in a clear direction precisely because it's so serious and because we as uh, a sovereign state need to respond. Uh, and voice our opinion about the attack. If we move to non-democratic uh, threat, non-military threats to democracy, we now see a new administration in the United States after a challenging election and a dramatic storming of uh, the Capitol in January, staged by groups that uh, basically believed conspiratorial uh, movement as Ukraine on. And there are also key forces in the Biden administration, uh, amongst others, uh, security policy advisor Jake Sullivan and the new head of national intelligence, April Haynes, have recently worked on non-military threats against democracies. They identified four areas of threats, economic, political, technological, and information-related threats against democracies. What are your expectations uh, to the Biden administration in these areas? First, I believe that both the president, the uh, U.S. administration, and uh, the political environment uh, in the U.S. will have a very demanding job at bringing the nation together. The divides in the U.S. society that have existed for a number of years, but that President Trump spent quite a lot of uh, effort not only to nourish, but also to use it as a mobilizing force to his own, well, what do I call it, his own movement and the re-election campaign, has left uh, lasting traces. It's not easy now to see a situation where these uh, conspiracy theories are simply uh, go away. And this, uh, there was also uh, Mitch McConnell today who gave a serious uh, reprimand because he said that, you know, it's not a, just a matter of uh, communicating uh, conspiracies, but sometimes it's outright lies. But we need to understand that the U.S. society is uh, so divided uh, that what they lack is fundamental trust. It takes time to restore trust. Very often, we look at analysis, for example, of uh, voting patterns uh, for Democrats and uh, Republicans over time. And what one has observed is that over the past 20 to 25 years, uh, the voting pattern has uh, actually uh, been more polarized. Uh, there are increasingly fewer cases where they, uh, they actually have you know, uh, unity across political barriers. But we see that that also uh, is infectious. It passes to the population. And uh, Republicans and Democrats take their information and use to a very little degree from the same sources. Uh, if you look, if you watch in CNN or Fox, is based on your values. People who follow them don't go to the same schools, don't live in the same areas. There are very few arenas where they kind of sit down to discuss based on a common understanding of the realities. Uh, Pew Research did a survey and showed that only 17% now has uh, confidence in uh, the country's authorities. And this has declined over time. And if you're going to restore the society to a less 
Restore Society, One United, uh, un uh, U.S. is difficult because uh, there are differences in society that polarizes it, uh, black and white, uh, rich, poor. There are many different differences, but there's also a question about trust and confidence. And if you don't have confidence, then it's very easy to resort to uh, conspiracy. If you don't have trust in your authorities, don't trust the news, uh, only have access to others who believe what you believe. Uh, and here the question is, of course, algorithms and uh, whatever it is. But uh, if you go to the same source of news uh, and uh, the, you uh, get a reinforcement of your own beliefs and there's no countering, of course, that's difficult. We use US as example now because that is the most dramatic example and the f most recent one but no one is immune against this my opinion is that we in Norway is lucky because we have a fundamental trust to other uh, inhabitants uh, to our government and authorities and also to our media who kind of corrects information and beliefs and also uh, gives us uh, more impartial information and I believe that is very important in a society. Thank you, Minister. You will also be joining the panel to discuss precisely the problems that you now raise uh, towards the end of the conference. Influence uh, campaigns, information campaigns in our digital world. We have invited Kasten de Vries uh, from the Norwegian uh, Institute of All International Politics. Uh, we also have uh, Lieutenant Col Colonel Geir Hågen Carlson from the Norwegian Defense University College, and we have news editor Knut Magnus Berger from the NRK News. We've heard two interventions from uh, Thomas Ridd and uh, Francis Fukuyama. Mr. Fukuyama referred to Peter Pomerantsev, who studied uh, Russian propaganda from the old days when it was all about promoting your own system. But now we are in an era where propaganda aims at uh, increasing doubts in democratic society about the legitimacy of your own system. Now, that's a difference. Uh, situation, but still, it's a bit difficult to get a handle on the threat situation. What's it really about, and why does it pose a challenge to Norway? Because, as the Minister of Foreign Affairs also mentioned, the Norwegian society uh, has higher level of trust. We have a more unified understanding of the world, but there are still some features that exert pressure on it. So, I would like to invite the panel to define the threats. What? do these threats look like for Norway? Here we start with our uniformed member. With globalization and digitalization, foreign forces have uh, more tools to influence Norwegian policy. If we focus on China and Russia, the major players, let me give you some overview. Military power from Putin's uh, demonstrations uh, regarding hypersonic missiles uh, to big um, own notified uh, exercises along the Norwegian coast uh, aims at uh, also influencing our policies. And we also heard the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Well, information influence, uh, maybe it co covers uh, disinformation and uh, inf campaigns, but it also covers uh, troll factories. An increasing area is economy, technology, and energy, where both the Russia and China are major players, all in the different ways. Cyber, of all the security services that I've read reports from, they all highlight cyber as an important arena. It is used for intelligence, also for influencing, as we saw in the US elections, but it can also be used to sabotage or threat sabotage against critical societal infrastructure. The, uh, states also use uh, their own minorities abroad. Uh, maybe it's not always that successful, but at least they try. But we also have soft power and culture, etc. And 
Russia and uh, China are not major players. But let me illustrate this from a practical point of view. We are now negotiating a trade agreement with China. China is a big and growing economy, and of course we want to do trade with them. And then the question is, how can we do that without making ourselves vulnerable to political pressure? Australia is in frequent trade conflicts. They had an uh, 212.2% uh, of uh, duty tariffs upon imports of wine. So how can we handle increase of trade without rendering ourselves politically vulnerable? Probably we can export three times as much salmon as we do, but if we export um, environmental technology, we will not be vulnerable. Paint will be sold even with sanctions uh, for protecting Chinese ship because they need it. We didn't get 5G from China, but they're big in technology for smart cities. It's the same technology that they use in China for monitoring their minorities. Norwegian players and customers with m municipalities and cities, they don't have the security policy or thinking. So these are areas that we need to focus on where security is important. I am in a uniform, Kashmir, he works uh, on cyber attacks. We are more focused on cyber attacks and, and military might, but there are new fields that we need to look at to exploit the possibilities in the future. Now, Kashmir, cyber attacks as to Tutan, well, in my local community that has never happened, but it's, it, it's something very new. But we've talked about today are at least three different things so we need to address things in the right way and draw distinctions here. Fukuyama talks a lot about the big technology companies, the big tech, that they can turn off Twitter to do something to President Trump. They can de direct democratic discussions without this being under direct democratic control. So this is a democratic problem. And then we have algorithms that uh, may lead to mobilization and and also polarization. And then we have these influence operations that we have mentioned here. That's one ta category, and Thomas Ritt talked about it. They've become ever more sophisticated. And then we have hacking, the third kind. We had this break-in, this hacking, like we had in the Norwegian parliament. These are three different problems, and they require three different solutions. And I think that maybe the first and last are the most serious ones, because influence operations, at least, towards Norway have not been very successful, but of course we have to pay attention to influence operations as well. We will not talk a lot about the first one because it's regulation of big tech is maybe not what we're going to address uh, here today, but digital attacks, cyber warfare, uh, which is a tabloid title, this will be demanding to handle, and although we make a tribute and say who is behind. It is limited what we can do about it. It's a challenge that doesn't seem to, to diminish, quite the contrary, and we need to find solutions to that problem. Okay, now the media, even though influence operations and campaigns are not very visible in Norway so far, then clearly it's part of the overall picture. Please, Knut Magnus Berge from the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Well, we have talked about the attack on the Norwegian Parliament. It's interesting to hear what NATO Secretary General said at this conference yesterday. He did put a lot of emphasis on China, on how China is a state that doesn't share our values. He, he talk, we have heard about Joe Biden. He, he envisages a League of Democracies, and the picture where we, uh, this is like a value battle between democratic and non-democratic states. And then Norway would also be an interesting target in that uh, context. We shouldn't be too naive with regard to these issues, but to us in the media, the question is, how should we uh, prepare to not become tools in the hands of people who don't want the best for our democracies? Now, do you have a few comments? Absolutely. If I may address what Knut Magnus said here, Precisely this awareness about these issues is something that uh, all players should have, and it's very important. We need to be prepared also in the coming times that one way of thinking uh, about influence is hacking systems, get hold of uh, uh, 
um, secret documents and show them to the media who find these to be very interesting, but they don't know whether the documents are uh, leg legitimate. Maybe they have replaced four words. Uh, so maybe the media run the errands for other states, foreign states, enemy states. We haven't had that awareness in Norway because we have felt that we, it hasn't affected us as much as other states, but we need to be very much aware going forward. This is just an example, this of being presented with classified documents. That is just an example of how an influence operation can be carried out, and the res but the responsibility and the understanding that you need to have when you are at the receiving end of that kind of information will be important. And when we discuss the more hybrid uh, aspects of influence, etc., then I find that an interesting aspect of development is that before hybrid means were often used by the part in the conflict that was uh, not the dominant one because they didn't have big um, tanks or marine vessels for that matter, but could use these hybrid means. They have all always existed. They now are very different from what they looked like before because of technology in particular, but the, in principle, and like you mentioned before, it's about creating so much chaos and unpredictability as possible in the decision-making process. That is what they're designed for now. Also, the superior party to a conflict or a relationship will use these means. And what they have in common, many of them, especially on the military side or actually in the field between the military and the civil part, is that they have been designed to not get to an Article 5 situation in NATO. They're just below the radar. It should create the maximum of difficulty for NATO to decide whether this is an attack or not. And also decision makers then will be faced with new issues and problems. And I agree with Knut Magnus that we should not be naive in when we encounter this. We should maybe look later at what means are at our disposal. But it's important to be aware that this will also affect us like it will affect everybody else. Now, just to continue along the lines of the minister, Bornava Lunde, who used to be the, the, for, the former head of intelligence Norway, if you have a cyber storm, an attack against Norway, we will have a serious attack against the media, the, t the TV networks, electricity, c commerce, payment systems, banks, etc. This is something we need to consider. We will also have an information storm, a propaganda storm, with the purpose of having the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the rest of the government to spend a bit too much time on reaching their decisions. We have seen this in Ukraine and other places. The purpose would be to undermine trust among the public in the government's decisions, so that decision will take longer time and be more difficult to implement. And probably also it will intend to uh, model the picture uh, what's happening, so military and other kinds of support we'll get later. So with regard to that kind of information, uh, we will experience a pressure we've never experienced. I, we're not really prepared for this, unfortunately. Let me just add that, well, you said this linear, that this will become before a military situation, but that's not necessarily true. Already today we see these means being used because a threshold is lower for using them and the the risk is lower, the cost is lower. So this may take place in many fields. We talk about hybrid measures for, but then you use more and more uh, means uh, in different sectors without crossing a line. And this may change the debate in society, the public debate, without people noticing if, until this has actually happened. And what you need to do as a society is first to prepare for the big storm which may come in a uh, crisis situation, but you also need to think perhaps as much as to how to preserve trust in society between citizens uh, long before we get there, and perhaps without understanding that we're going in that direction. What the Chinese in 2003, they launched the three wars with non-military means that are to, this will be information, uh, influence information campaigns and le legal strategies and Reid describes Russian players as creative and cunning. So what means do we have to strengthen our resilience in society? Because one thing is to enter the structure, something else is to make people 
conscious and aware of what is going on around in society without falling into the trap of entering into a climate and atmosphere where we are suspicious of everybody and everything because then we'll wind up in that same spot. Let me start with Knut Magnus. Knut Magnus, you first. I think it was right, as you said, that our point of departure is uh, quite uh, positive. There is a high level of trust between the citizens and uh, the government. Uh, we have stable institutions, a uh, small degree of polarization in Norway. The influence uh, campaigns very often aims at uh, intensifying uh, um, inherent conflicts in society. So to us in the media community is all about raising our awareness of uh, what tools we have as journalists, uh, be critical to sources of information, ask ourselves why do we receive this information? Do we really know where it comes from? Who would benefit from us forwarding and communicating this information? And this type of source criticism is something that we need to do in order to brace ourselves against the future. If we can raise our awareness on these matters, I believe that that is the contribution that we primarily can do in order to protect ourselves. Yes, Gail. Let me highlight uh, four things based on a research uh, study, raising awareness, reducing vulnerability. The third is uh, active countermeasures, and the fourth is uh, expertise or competency and uh, research. Raising awareness, uh, if people are aware of the threats, it will be more difficult to fool them. As uh, Knut Magnus said, while media will be very important, but also the debate we're having here is also a contribution. Number two, reducing vulnerability. I think we need to review all sectors of society, not only the foreign policy area, the military, it will apply to research, finance, sectors, where is our vulnerability? And especially also when it comes to uh, data, the uh, Auditor General's Office also saw that uh, and uh, concluded that uh, our hospital sector was vulnerable for attacks. There is an ongoing cyber conflict between the US, uh, China and Russia and some others that hit Norway every single day. Americans have a rather vulnerable infrastructure, partly because they have 50 states and a series of private companies with their challenges so that they don't use their cyber capability as they could because they're vulnerable. And also when it comes to the countermeasures that we took after the Russian uh, cyber attacks against our parliament uh, was effective and uh, also we there were many MPs uh, that were felt that the attack was very personal kind of and were very upset there are not uh, too many when it comes to research uh, that are working on this I mean you could probably fit all of them uh, on the uh, in a small vehicle you need to combine competency and expertise in small units that can be effective. The Swedes are setting is setting up a, an agency that can actually compile all uh, expertise on influence uh, and do uh, studies and research. We don't have anything about that. If you look at the societal public security report that came last autumn, we don't really have much to offer there. The last is, of course, communication. You need to bring all good forces together to make them cooperate. Uh, because in Norway, we have separate ministries, uh, separate ministers uh, that uh, have their separate uh, responsibilities. We need to make everything work together. Even though we have uh, many uh, high level of trust and uh, also good cooperation, we are vulnerable and we can't rest on our laurels. Uh, we need to, to protect our democracy every single day. We also need to have open institutions that can help uh, build this uh, confidence. And also, uh, we saw that the, the US has survived Trump because of some of this. As for the 
international threats. The problem is that we don't have full overview. Of course, we have the combined joint uh, military headquarters. Uh, they have all the screens, all the information. They know what is happening there. But we don't have a head of operations uh, for attacks against Norway when they can highlight, for example, um, taking over of uh, properties, for example, of the information, and things could happen before we become aware of it. Gail said that, you know, in, uh, responsibility is um, dispersed, um, and that is good because we don't want uh, a society where all control is, um, is on just a few hands. Uh, but we need to be aware, and we also need to have an open mind looking at the situation and try to find solutions uh, to prevail uh, and also to find uh, secure, good security measures uh, without having to monitor all citizens. Minister, do you have any measures to offer? Well, a lot of wise things have been said, but I would like to add that international cooperation will become increasingly important. We also participate in the NATO's uh, Helsinki Center for exchange of such uh, information of threats, and we also see that there is gradually more in cooperation between uh, intelligence services around the world, and uh, that is because, because we can then help each other to identify threats and uh, vulnerabilities. But uh, I believe that uh, Working on our legislative uh, works, we had a security act uh, it replaced a 20 year old act. I was then uh, the Ministry of Defense, and that was uh, of decisive importance to uh, kind of tighten some, uh, eliminate some loops. Uh, and uh, it might also help us to uh, stop uh, concrete. Uh, Investments. We also had a new intelligence act uh, last year. We also have a combined cyber coordination center. And as Castle says, that it's not as if you have a big uh, venue where everyone sits together, but uh, it focuses on cyber attacks, and that is important. But measures to raise awareness, I think that is one of the most important things that we can do. And I believe that uh, our security and intelligence uh, services. Uh, now uh, have, uh, do uh, public uh, reports. And I think that is important because it makes people aware of what the threats are, what people can do to protect themselves. And I believe that many activities and many individuals now take a different view on this than they do. The fact that there was also a good cooperation between such services is very good. Before the 2019, general election is something that we will be re repeating uh, this year, the election. The, every, all 60,000 uh, candidates for political party lists uh, got uh, a plan of actions for how they could reduce their own vulnerability. And we will update that plan now. I believe that everyone here is well, has a relatively high awareness if someone try to uh, give us an offer we can't refuse or wants to have a cup of coffee to get information, I mean, and what to do about it. But if you are, for example, ranked as number 17 on a political party's list uh, in rural Norway, maybe their awareness is not big enough. So we do this in order to reduce vulnerability. The dialogue we're having with many municipalities and regions who want a dialogue with us because, for example, they receive offers, uh, for example, of investments in critical infrastructure, then that is also part of a very important job that we do. We share information and we also sometimes need to explain uh, things uh, in a context where they don't have uh, such information. That is one of the most important thing that we can do uh, the, in the public administration and government. Uh, and I think that we can all help each other, all represented here. I would like to give you a question from one of our audiences. It also addresses what Fukuyama said regarding user control structures. What can we do internationally 
uh, in terms of uh, technology to get a better control of developments. We've also heard one question. We need the UN and NATO to regulate big tech when it comes to the risk of um, uh, influence operations. Norway can't do that alone, but still we can do something to protect our IT systems uh, better against cyber attacks. Why don't we do more? And what can we possibly do on the international arena to collaborate with others in order to make this happen? Then let's start with you, or, or with you. Okay, let's start with the cyber expert. It's completely correct, as has been pointed out, that this is not only something that happens in Norway. These are foreign companies in a foreign jurisdiction in the USA. In this case, not only influence operations is that we're talking about. It's the business model for these companies, unfortunately. Strong emotions create more clicks, more ads, to put it very simple. And that is demanding when this is added to politics because this uh, creates more polarized political debates. The boring, the to the point debates don't receive so many clicks. And it's not really easy to change the model because it's about the business model of these services. And to regulate that way would be a, a difficult task. What can Norway do? Well, the USA must start. And uh, I don't think we can do a lot for some time yet, but we need allies. And the European Union is our most important partner because they've already done some things with regard to protecting personal data, privacy, and also taxing of uh, big companies. So the most important thing we can do is to involve ourselves even more with the EU in this respect to have a kind of regulation of these matters. But we do agree that regulation out there will also influence this situation here at home. Yes, Cotton mentioned something important. With regard to big tech, we need to work with the EU and other allies because we go straight to uh, U.S. trade policies and autonomy, etc. So that's difficult. With regard to big tech, we have two issues. One is the influence operations and platform for polarization that they constitute. But you also have questions as to what extent are they to be allowed to censor public debates, democratic debates. So these are two important issues. As regards data security, let me put it this way. You never finish building a firewall and go home. This is an ongoing activity on a daily basis. Norwegian defense forces are, are subject to at least a thousand attacks per day. Some of them are not very sophisticated, but we also have the big uh, dangerous attacks. So this is a major area of priority. We need to think of security within all fields of society. For instance, within the health services, we have now an increased awareness with regard to privacy issues. Also, the Norwegian Auditor General has addressed this. And the more we do trade with China, the more serious uh, it will be to treat data security. You may also be subject to IP theft, tech, the theft of uh, business plans, technology. So many should join this struggle. Now, normally I shouldn't tell Norway what Norway should do. Probably the Minister of Foreign Affairs can address this later. But I must say that it's a very interesting point that Fukuyama has raised, that Twitter, a big tech company, can sit and decide that the U.S. president no longer is to be allowed to speak. Maybe a lot of people in Norway and other countries were happy about that decision, but in principle, that is completely untenable. We need some kind of framework here, but perhaps the minister can address that issue. Well, as to this question that was raised, it is evident that it's the international community and especially the EU that are important to us in this respect. We also see some attempts within the UN system at regulating this more globally. Now, the road to the finishing line would be longer through the, uh, the UN, but the, we, can, uh, the, we have the EEA agreement with the EU, between the EU, EU and Norway, so we are cooperating with both the EU as such and also individual countries within the EU who have made inroads in this field. And especially the Baltics are good with regard to cybersecurity, so we have close connections with them in those fields. We were, are working in several fields, but as Gade says, 
the one who believes that you once and for all can say that now I've fi finished my protection against cyber attacks because probably when you finish building your protective measures, they're outdated, and then you need to have good professionals, good professional communities that you can rely on. We have that in Norway, but you also depend on cooperating more broadly. Well, I would like to raise what Knut Magnus mentioned and also Fukuyama said. Our digital world can censor some voices and make some voices, maybe like uh, like the one in of Europe, becomes disproportionately high. Now, you work within the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. You have a mandate of creating a Norwegian public atmosphere. How do you relate to social media that exists in addition to the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation? Because 30 years ago, you had almost like a monopoly uh, with regard to Norwegian society, perception of threats, and what the Norwegian government does and does not do for the Norwegian public. Now, how do you relate, relate to this at Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation? Well, we follow a number of tracks at the same time. But I believe that our role as such as edited media um, is in a situation would we, where we have an enormous surplus of information and we have all of these voices that people trust or not. So our most important competitive advantage is that we can deliver credible information because there's no lack of information as such, but we need to have the role that when big and important things happen that are important to have a factual basis for, then we and other edited media are the ones that people will resort to. And we relate to social media in many contexts. We, for instance, uh, gather tips out there. We see what people are focused on, what they're interested in. But journalists, maybe we relate too much to the social media, the discussions especially the political discussions that take place in social media are smaller than what people think. It turns out that even though the debate in social media is highly polarized, it's not all that polarized among the general public. I want to take up something that Thomas Reid said, and I took note of it. It's about the active measures in the influence campaigns compared to the Cold War they have become more active and less measured. Yes, and what I deduct from that is that it's not all that much about fake news. When you talk about credibility, what, what, what are we talking about? Those influence campaigns that Rich talks about, they plant things that take on a life of their own. And when journalists, research scientists, and uh, government appointed committees, they look at this, they enlarge them and they run the errands of the campaign. How do we relate to that dilemma? Who wants to say something about that? Well, I can start. A lot of what has been talked about is digital to a large extent today. You hack, you leak documents like the ministry, and Knut Magnus mentioned. You use this, you modify them, and then you create f fake cases, fake issues that you can work on. I worked with these issues for many years. You may become fascinated with uh, how refined these attacks are, but we shouldn't exaggerate how efficient they may be in influencing people. It's difficult to succeed. It's difficult to reach a lot of people. I have looked at many of these, well, some, some Russian see, it looks seemingly think tanks and media sites and but if you look at how many they actually reach, they don't reach a whole lot of people over time. Well, we, we, we also have this Russian English language TV channel, and people are worried that they reach a lot of people. I don't think that's true because as regards viewers uh, in countries where this is measured, this indicates that not a lot of people view this. We have a very active YouTube channel, but if you look at what they show, it's little politics, it's a lot of meteorites, car crashes, etc. We probably have done these things to increase the number of viewers. And it has to do with also what, uh, what Fukuyama and Reid said earlier. If you look at how fascinating this is, we make this a bigger problem than what it is, and then we start calling, we had this debate in the USA and in England, 
the Russians were behind Brexit, the Russians are behind uh, Trump, and then you get an internal division that is much more destructive than what has been said. Richard Stengel, he was the Vice Secretary of State under uh, Hillary Clinton. He, he looked at CNN. He, CNN did infinitely more to get Donald Trump elected than any Russian troll farm. That's what he said. Well, just to address what he says, this is really interesting because I think that Donald Trump, in many ways, he has break, broken many of the barriers uh, and models within journalism. One should think that something that the most powerful person in the world says is news. And it, it, even, it, it is important, even if he just scolds other heads of state or scolds TV programs or has other initiatives. So if you should apply normal criteria, what is newsworthy, Donald Trump for years was capable of filling the news landscape virtually single-handedly. And the fact that he dominated the arena so totally probably contributed towards him being elected, for instance. And this is a dilemma to us because every individual incident is newsworthy, but the overall picture gives and becomes disbalanced with regard to other uh, candidates. Well, let me comment on one thing. It's very interesting, but this time it was towards the end of the campaign that even Fox News started to interrupt uh, election uh, rallies. And of course, he communicated differently. Normally, journalists uh, wanted to interview candidates, but he went around that. He used his own channels to communicate. And of course, the consequences for him was very big when the news channels uh, kind of uh, shut him down after the election. But when we talk about uh, influence campaigns and what the effects are on Norwegian society, then I would like to say that I believe that we are, have a lot of resilience to handle it. And again, to use the U.S. as uh, an example, everything depends in principle on the landscape uh, that uh, an uh, influence campaign uh, ends up. If, for example, you have a polarized society, uh, where you, for example, have a community that is not exposed to other uh, opinions, etc., then it could do harm. Uh, however, if uh, it lands in a context where the fundamental characteristic is uh, trust and confidence and where we take our information from more or less the same sources, I believe that we are better equipped to deal with it. I don't mean to say that, uh, for example, our media, NRK, TV2, uh, one of Aftenposten uh, Daily are the m main sources. Maybe I'm old fashioned, but I believe that it's still valuable that uh, the majority of the Norwegian adult population watches the evening news. Uh, well, m maybe I should actually uh, put in a disclaimer here, and that is the evening news on. The NRK, but that gives us also a common point of reference. It is so important that both uh, the Minister of Health and the health authorities have been available every single day during the pandemic to answer questions, to show us when they are uncertain, to uh, also uh, tell us about our vulnerability. And I think that has actually made us less susceptible to conspiracy conspiracies and uh, theories and uh, lack of trust. And if we compare ourselves to other countries where the big demonstrations, I think uh, this is a sign of it. We should not take the, our confidence in our government uh, as granted, but I think it will add to our resilience generally. Also, especially the situation we now find ourselves. We'll do one final round. We are now in the midst of a um, big pandemic where people's, uh, people's uh, access to information is confined to digital sources. So maybe we are more expo exposed to it. In the darkest nooks and crannies of science, uh, where we look at uh, analysis, uh, we find uh, 
discussions about the virus that are most effective as a weapon against another society. A highly infectious virus with a 2 to 20 percent mortality rate is considered to be the most dangerous. And uh, that is not because it kills the most, but because it undermines uh, effectively to the authorities. And this is not something to talk about uh, the government's response to the COVID uh, epidemic, but uh, more to see what uh, the effects may be. I would like to go one final round to ask you, how shall we consider these things when there's m when information and sources of information are more under pressure than we have faced for many years. Please, Kassen, you first. Just to add to what was already said, Norway is rather robust, but we don't have to travel far into Europe uh, to see that there's more pressure and uh, even further east, uh, democracies are even more vulnerable. And if uh, Europe is destabilized, it is not good for our security. We can't simply lean back and say that, all right, we'll just let everyone else uh, fare as they may. But uh, the influence operations that may try to stir things up, uh, whether it is uh, regarding the pandemic or other matters, that we don't really give them must much attention. Sputnik and other theories, you know, are quite rampant. When we talk about resilience, how we can be resilient to such threats, it's not just building a wall or have a backup and then you're done. Because uh, all the threats change so quickly and uh, resilience needs to be adapted to situations on an ongoing basis. It's not as if, you know, you build up protection once. Uh, it's also about resilience for technical systems. Let me first uh, just uh, <laughs> conclude that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is not old-fashioned. When I heard the Carstens talk about influence operation, we need expertise and we need people who actually pay attention and monitor because this is developed uh, on an ongoing basis because what Russia and China are doing today is very different from what they did a few years ago. And also we need to expose it to the public as uh, the Minister has helped us do and uh, then to deal with it. That's the less expensive way of doing it. Uh, I will not uh, comment uh, on uh, any of the other things that were said. Knut Magnus, well, when it comes to the pandemic, uh, then uh, we are faring quite well. But we will also have to look at the society that we find at the other end of the pandemic. Uh, of course, attacks uh, that can make us more vulnerable may also open our society to such attacks. First, I would like to say thank you to Gary Hogan uh, since he concluded I was not uh, old-fashioned. But my point was that the NRK Evening News uh, is something that everyone watches, whether it's uh, linearly or whether it is uh, on other digital platform. But this also results in a different criticism against digital information. And that's also a strength when we're going to build up resilience. And especially the U.S. study, 17 percent of the public that has uh, confidence in U.S. Uh, authorities. That tells us uh, also how difficult it is to deal with a pandemic uh, because uh, he, Joe Biden has a formidable job. Uh, I would like to thank all our panelists for the contributions. All right, all remains for me is to thank our speakers, uh, panelists, and not least you, Cecilia, for a very interesting day in February and a great end to this year's Liang Kolln Security Conference. I would also like to thank Medvin event organizers and not least my own little crew in the Norwegian Atlantic Committee, Andrea Sofia Nilsson, Christopher Wall Ulvesta and Camilla Cecilia Bruner, who from their home offices uh, have brought this year's conference to fruition from idea to implementation. A warm thank you to all. 
And to all of you out there in cyberspace, I would like to thank you for watching. Let's hope that uh, today's uh, dive into technology has increased your knowledge and understanding for the brave new world and digital platforms. It opens for many interesting venues, debates, and opportunities, but also require that we all acknowledge our vulnerabilities and actively build up our resilience. For those who want to, it's also possible to revisit uh, the conference and watch it again at our own websites and in social media. Goodbye, and I'll see you again at the next venue.